eggplant. Hello, welcome to this video where I'll cover some advanced scripting topics that will help you make your scripts both powerful and robust. The first topic to discuss is variables. An understanding of variables will allow you to easily work with data and solve interesting challenges throughout your scripts. Variables are named containers that you can name however you'd like so that your code can be easily understood. Variables serve to hold values or even objects such as property lists. If you are setting up a parameterized script, you'll likely use variables to do so. You can assign values to a variable using either the set command or the put command. The following examples of working with variables will focus on use The following examples of working with variables will focus on using the set command. Many scripting languages have the concept of typed variables, where the type of data stored in the variable, such as a string or a number, must be declared with the variable. However, SenseTalk is a typeless language, which means no type declaration is needed, and SenseTalk automatically parses the value as required within your script. Variable scope is another consideration. The variables discussed in this module are local variables only, meaning their scope does not extend beyond the handler where the variable is set. SenseTalk also includes global, universal, and suite variables if a different scope is required. Let's cover some examples of using the set command to store different values into variables. In this first example, the variable's name is var and the value is the number 5. The second example shows string john being stored into the variable var name. The last example shows a list being stored into a variable named var list. The list contains a combination of numbers and strings, but because SenseTalk variables are typeless, no special handling of this mix of value types is needed. Accessing values that are stored in variables is easy and can be done using commands such as the log commands or the put command. Concatenation provides a way to combine values, including those stored in variables, together with other values and variables. Ampersand is used for concatenation. A single ampersand concatenates the values without a space, and a double ampersand concatenates with a space. Here are two examples of concatenation. Note the distinction between using one and two ampersands. Earlier in this discussion about variables, you saw the syntax, using the set command, for creating a basic list. Note how each item in the list is separated by a comma and the list is bounded by parentheses. These are the default components needed to define a list with the set command. The insert command can also be used to create a list. The insert command, combined with the words after or before, is also useful for adding values into a list. The value can be inserted either at the beginning or the end of a list, or before or after or into a particular position within the list. These examples show using the insert command to add values into the list in specific positions within that list. Particular items within a list can be accessed by their position within that list. The item can be accessed by its item number, as in these examples, or by using the ordinal. For example, log the first item of cookie list. SenseTalk also supports expressions such as the last or the penultimate, or notation such as minus one for referencing the last item in a list. It's easy to determine how many items are in a list by using the expression the number of items. The value of the expression can be used in various ways, such as with a log message or by being stored into a variable. The random function provides a simple way to randomly choose a number or chunk from a set of possible numbers, characters, list items, and more. With the random function, you can create dynamic data for test inputs or choose values from a list of acceptable values for use in a test. These first two examples show how to use the random function to choose from a range of possible numbers, either starting with 1 or starting with some other number, such as 10. The random function can also be used to pick an item from a list, either by choosing a random item number or by using the any expression. Logical comparisons are useful for performing various types of validations, such as between an expected and actual data value, or when determining whether an undesirable condition has been met. In a logical comparison, a value is compared or parsed to determine whether that value meets certain criteria. Most often, a logical comparison happens within the context of a conditional statement or assert command. Here's an example of a logical comparison within a conditional statement. 
the value of the repeat index function is being evaluated to determine whether it's above 10. Here's another example within a conditional statement, where a value stored within a variable is being evaluated according to whether it's a letter, a number, or neither. Assert commands provide another structure for performing logical comparisons. Repeat loops are a highly useful structure that can combine the concepts of variables, logical comparisons, lists, and more. More generally, repeat loops are used any time you need to repeatedly execute a set of statements. Sometimes repeat loops are even used within repeat loops, creating nested repeat loops. There are several types of repeat loops that repeat based on different types of conditions. Note how these different repeat loops begin with repeat and end with end repeat. The simplest repeat loops allow you to repeat a set of statements a given number of times or for a given period of time. Some of the most powerful repeat loops repeat according to chunks, such as items in a list, or until certain conditions, such as an image being visible on the screen of SUT, are met. Later, I'll discuss using repeat loops in the context of scrolling reliably on the SUT or iterating through a set of objects on the screen. This section of the video will cover a set of special functions that will become very useful when doing advanced scripting. The first function is called image location. Image location returns the coordinates of a hotspot of an image or of the center of an OCR search, where they appear on the SUT. As in this first example, which performs an OCR search, the returned location can be stored into a variable. This second example shows how to perform coordinate math against the image location to create a location that is 400 pixels to the left and 500 pixels above the original image location. Subtracting from a point moves that point farther up the screen or to the left, while adding to the point will move it farther down or to the right. Image rectangle is similar to image location, but it returns a list of two coordinate pairs. The first pair represents the top left corner of the image or OCR text rectangle on the screen and the other represents the bottom right corner. Here are two examples showing basic use of image rectangle. The remote screen size function returns the pixel width and height of the SUT. Please note that there's also a remote screen rectangle function. There's a set of rectangle functions that make working with the return of the image rectangle easy. The top, bottom, left, and right functions return a single coordinate that represents the edges of the rectangle. The top and bottom functions return a Y coordinate, and the left and right functions return an X coordinate. Top left, top right, bottom left, and bottom right return XY coordinate pairs that represent points on the rectangle. For example, top left returns the coordinate pair for the top left corner of the rectangle. The center function returns the point at the center of the rectangle. There are also the top center, bottom center, left center, and right center functions, which combine the x or y coordinate of the specified edge of the rectangle with the x or y coordinate of the center of the rectangle. The x and y functions provide a method to easily reference the x and y coordinates for a particular point, such as the point returned by the remote screen size function. Here are some examples of using the various rectangle and point functions. The first example shows how to extract the x coordinate from the remote screen size. The second example shows how to extract the top left corner of the image rectangle for a particular image search. The third example combines a few different rectangle and point functions to build a new rectangle based on a starting rectangle and the remote screen size. Image location, image rectangle, and the rectangle and point functions are particularly useful when setting up search rectangles, which is the next topic I'll discuss. Search rectangles specify a subset of the screen that should be searched by eggplant. A search rectangle can be specified via the global property, such as in this first example. This search rectangle is based on the position of the hotspot of the dialog upper left image and on a pixel adjustment of 50 pixels to the right and 10 pixels down from the hotspot of the dialog lower right image. Note the use of the image location function when performing the pixel adjustment. Any searches executed after setting the search rectangle global property will honor that search rectangle. The search rectangle can be returned to full screen, which is the default, by using the empty keyword or a pair of empty parentheses. The second example shows how to set the search rectangle within the context of a specific search, using the search rectangle property. 
This search rectangle is based on the hotspot of an OCR search, in the lower right corner of the SUT screen, as returned by the remote screen size function. Search rectangles can be defined based on image searches, OCR searches, coordinates, or a combination of all three. We recommend using image or OCR searches, or the remote screen size, as often as possible to define search rectangles, as the search rectangle will change with the position of those components automatically. Search rectangles have a few main uses. They are used to improve the performance of image and OCR searches by limiting the portion of the screen that needs to be analyzed or searched. They're also useful for validating UI layouts as they provide a mechanism for determining whether an element is located in a certain part of the screen or is located relative to another element. This training module will show how to use search rectangles in the context of handling multiple instances of an element on the set. The next function I'll discuss is the every image location function. Every image location returns the coordinate positions of all instances for an image search or OCR search on the screen. The coordinates are returned in the form of a list, and the list is ordered based on the instance's distance from the upper left corner of the SUT screen. For example, the instance that is closest to the upper left corner will have its coordinate location appear first in the list. Here are some examples of using every image location. The first example uses the item number syntax to reference the third item from the list returned by every image location. The second example uses the ordinal syntax to reference the second item from the list returned by every image location. Every image location is also useful in cases where you'd like to interact with all instances of an element on a particular screen, or count the number of instances of an element. That's what this third example does. Note the use of a repeat with each repeat loop to iterate through each checkbox and click on it. A common challenge that comes up when automating GUIs is handling multiple elements on the screen, such as these duplicated drop-down menus or checkboxes. Every image location in search rectangles provide two powerful methods for handling this scenario, and the methods can be combined. Every image location is quick and easy to use. The every image location function approach depends on the position of the desired instance of the element relative to the other instances on the screen being predictable. It's also important that all instances of the element are already loaded on the screen prior to using every image location. Search rectangles are not dependent on the relative position of duplicate elements, but require some additional setup. Using unique elements on the screen, such as the edit label, you can set up a search rectangle that prevents Eggplant from seeing undesirable instances of an element. Because Eggplant can only see what you can see on the screen of the SUT, this means some scrolling might be needed to reveal the element you wish to validate or interact with. On desktop SUTs, there are often multiple ways to scroll, from using the keyboard with type text commands, to interacting with the scroll bar using the mouse, or using the mouse scroll wheel. Eggplant is able to carry out any of these events on a desktop SUT, assuming the SUT supports these methods of scrolling. On mobile devices, the swipe commands are usually used to scroll, but the drag and drop command might be used when both the start and end locations of the scroll event must be specified. Which scrolling approach you choose also depends on whether there's a particular type of scrolling you need to test according to your requirements. Here are some examples of using the type text command to perform keyboard-based scrolling actions, including the arrow keys or the page down key. Often, scrolling events are repeated because multiple scrolling events are needed to reveal the desired element on the screen. Occasionally, the exact number of needed scrolling events is known. These examples show how to perform a scrolling event a specific number of times. In the repeat loop example, the frequency of each type text command is governed by a runtime setting known as the remote work interval. In the second example, the frequency is governed by the next key delay. I will discuss both the remote work interval and next key delay later in this module. Images can also be used to scroll. If a SUT does not support using keystrokes such as the arrow keys or the page up and page down keys, then interacting with the scroll bar is an option. Capture images of the scroll bar arrows or the scroll bar itself, and then use the click or drag and drop commands to interact with the scroll bar. Here are some examples. Note how the drag and drop example incorporates the image location function to specify an end location relative to the start location of the drag event. On mobile, you'll mostly use the swipe commands to scroll, 
you can swipe in four directions, up, down, left, and right. As shown in this second example, the swipe commands can take a single parameter, which is the image, text, or coordinate location that represents the start location for the swipe event. When scrolling to find a particular element on the screen, it's best to perform the scrolling event with a repeat until repeat loop, as the exact number of necessary scrolling events is often unknown, or can vary across devices or environments. This example repeat loop will repeat scrolling as many times as needed until the element appears on the screen. There's error handling within the repeat loop, so if for some reason the element does not appear, there's a way to exit the repeat loop. The timing of various events, such as keyboard and mouse events, are controlled by a set of run option global properties. For the large majority of global properties, the default values are appropriate, but there are some run option global properties we see adjusted fairly often. The run options can be configured either in the script or in the eggplant functional GUI preferences. When changing the value of a run option within a script, that value will stay in effect for the rest of the script execution. However, the execution has no bearing on the value set in the application preferences. The mouse click delay is a setting that controls the wait time between the mouse down and mouse up events that make up a single click. The default value is 0.02 seconds, which can be too fast for some applications under test. If you see issues where eggplant is sending a click but the set is not reacting to the event, consider increasing the mouse click delay. The next key delay controls the wait time between each keystroke that is sent to the SUT by a single type text command. The default value of 0.01 can be much too fast for some applications to handle properly, especially if the field being typed into uses some back-end processing, such as autocomplete. If you see skipped characters or misordered characters when using type text, consider slowing down the next key delay. The swipe speed controls how far a single swipe command swipes on a mobile device. Lower the swipe speed if a swipe is scrolling too far on the device, or if the swipe is accidentally tapping on the screen instead of swiping. The last run option global property I'll discuss is the remote work interval. This run option controls the minimum wait time between each event performed against the SUT. So for example, so for example if a script has a type text immediately following a click, the type text and click can happen no closer together than the value of the remote work interval. The default remote work interval of 0.7 seconds is quite conservative, so many users will decrease the value to speed up the overall execution of their scripts. In other situations, such as with a very slow to respond application, increasing the remote work interval might be required. You can find more information on the topics covered today by checking out our online documentation. We hope this module has helped prepare you to tackle some interesting automation challenges. See you next time!